Well, I have an, an awesome privilege to introduce somebody very special to you this morning. This is Brooke Perry. Can we I say am hi to Brooke? To you. <laughs> hi, Brooke. Well, I want to I want to explain to you why Brooke is here today because it is actually a very very cool story. Um, as you know, uh, as a church, it's kind of cool watching the video and just seeing what God has done in us. What God is doing in us right now is the result of somebody starting this church. Amen? Amen. Somebody had to start this thing. I, I, Kate and I didn't start it. A man named Steve Perry started it in 1981. Hopefully you're starting to make the connection. Brooke Perry, Steve Perry. In 1981, Steve Perry moved with his family to Cheney and began to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ here. In 1992, uh, Steve went to be with Jesus when he died of cancer. And since then, Cheney Face has, ha has had several other pastors, and Kate and I are now the fourth. A couple months ago, Brooke emailed me, and we started a conversation about her coming to Cheney Face Center, and she's going to talk about that. But what I'm super excited about is just this full circle of what God has done in her, what God has done in us as a church, and now we get to see uh, just these awesome stories of what God is doing. And Brooke's going to share a great message about what God's doing in her as a result of what God did even through her family and did through Cheney Face Center. So uh, I'm super excited about what she has to share. You're going to love it. So would you give an awesome Cheney Face Center welcome to Brooke Perry. Thank you, guys. Yeah, good morning. Um, this, is a, this is a very big deal to me. I recognize that a lot of you guys don't know who I am at all and didn't know my, my parents, so you're like, I don't really care, but uh, I'm glad that you're going to stay in the room and listen to me, even though you maybe didn't have a choice of me being here this morning. But um, yes, I am. my name is Brooke Perry. I am the daughter of Steve and Terry Perry, and I have a younger brother as well. Uh, but that was, that was just a lifetime ago. Um, as Pastor Mark said, I I did reach out. This is sort of a pilgrimage of sorts for me. Um, I don't know if Cheney is necessarily a destination for a lot of pilgrimages, but to me it is. I was born and raised here. I went to Betts Elementary, Cheney Middle School, Cheney High School. Uh, and then right after I graduated high school, I went back down, or I went down to Portland, Oregon, uh, where a lot of my family was from before my parents moved up here to plant this church and lived there for 13 years, minus a 10-month stint in San Diego. That's another story. Um, and then four years ago yesterday, I moved to Washington, D.C. So really just felt like the Lord told me to move to Washington, D.C. And I knew that that idea could not have possibly come from my own mind. And so thought it was the Lord. It was the Lord. And I have never regretted it. But I've been in D.C. now for four years uh, working for... Uh, National Community Church, Pastor Mark Batterson, if you guys have, he's uh, written The Circle Maker, he, you guys I know as a church went through Draw the Circle, or going to again, uh, which is just wild to me that I'm back here in Cheney Face Center and I see this circle on the wall of the church that has been so faithful to me in D.C. that I work for now, and it's just I'm having a moment, so, um, but God is good, God is so good, um, that's just a very quick snapshot of, of my life, my journey. Uh, I was eight years old when my dad passed away. I was born into this church, eight years old. I'm 30, I'll be 36 next month, so it's been almost 28 years this November that he passed away. And it's, if any of you guys have ever experienced a loss, you know that it only just stays with you. It, it gets easier, but it's still a huge part of your story. And so this is just a, an amazing privilege to be here. I, I'm a little bit in shock here, but um, let me move forward because I'll just keep saying that over and over again. Uh, the church, as we've heard, though, I've had a complicated relationship with it. Um, my dad was a pastor, obviously. My mom and dad, both very faithful followers. And then the person who was so faithful and had given so much to the church and was only 38 years old died. Right? And when something like that happens, it, it, it just changes things. It just, as a, as a little girl, that I, I wasn't consciously thinking about this stuff, but it started to plant a lot of doubt, a lot of disillusionment, um, a lot of confusion and unanswered questions, because one of the things that now I'm so grateful for that my dad had as a part of his legacy was his annoyingly strong faith. 
And I got really angry at him for a lot of years after he passed for how much faith he had. Because <laughs> I was like, he didn't prepare us at all. Like, I, he was just convinced that God could and would heal him. And yes, he had the ultimate healing. Yes, we will be together one day. I believe in those truths. It has carried me through a lot of stuff. But those don't make you feel better, right? In the moment, you're like, but God, why? We, my parents gave up everything to move here, plant this church, started it in their basement. And now this is what happens with, you know, my mom was left without her husband, my brother and I left without a dad, and the church that they had planted, some of you in this room were there almost 40 years ago, and there was just so much grief and unknown and questions, right? And I think that for me, as I've gone through this kind of complicated relationship with faith and God and his church over the years, I've realized something that has been very healing to me, and that is that confusion and unknown and doubt and anger can live in the same place as faith and hope and light. And for so long in my life, I thought that I needed to just get rid of this faith or this anger. I wanted to get rid of my faith too many times, believe me, actually. But I wanted to get rid of, I had to get rid of that anger. I had to get all those questions answered. I had to find some semblance of peace and hope in the fact that this was all just going to be okay in order to believe that a good God existed. And when I started to realize that actually when the, mo the most intimate of places in my faith have happened, when I've realized that I can bring my unanswered questions, my anger, my lack of faith, my doubt to the presence of the Holy Spirit and therefore have a much more intimate and deep interaction and experience with Jesus and with his church. Um, let me back up, though, for just a second. I, some of my earliest memories that I have are with my dad in the church and in one of the first buildings I think that Cheney Faith Center met in it's brick building up on the campus of Eastern Washington University uh, which was practically my dad's second home up at the campus there um, but he we would walk up from our house we lived on the corner of third and a street and he would take me I, at four five six seven years old he would take me with him and he would walk up to the church and we would just talk about life and he cared so much about my life, even at the, those young ages. He just wanted to know me. And it was, there were incredibly special times that I had with him. But I remember so clearly there, was, there were old wooden pews in this church and this bright red carpet, very traditional um, atmosphere. And he would be sitting up on his stool tuning his guitar and he was a one man show back then. so. Uh, led worship by himself. I don't even know if he was a good singer. Was he good? I don't even know. If he, I'm not. So I'm like, did he just think that he could? Because he, he could. He was the pastor. But um, played his guitar, tuned it up, and um, I would be sitting there coloring on the front pew, on coloring current, like, pages on the front view and he would be like coming and practicing a couple worship songs but then every time he would go into a rendition of grandma's feather bed from John by John Denver and I if you're looking at me like what I know like I don't know I don't even know that song other than the fact that my dad sang it to me and, and then we'd I'd join in in the chorus and it was a lot of fun and he just made me feel so much a part of what he was doing. And there was a joy that he had and an excitement that he had over this church. And as much as I have some of those amazing memories, right? Like there was such a good foundation that all changed when I was eight years old. And everything started to become a little bit fuzzy. But that's also when I started to understand, and, and not consciously, but I, looking back, it's when I started to understand that there's something much bigger going on here than about one pastor or one family or one church building, right? There's something so much bigger, but I also started to understand at the same moment that I wasn't always going to like it, that just because something was hard didn't mean that God wasn't in it. And so I had to wrestle with this. I still wrestle with this a lot. But over the next few years, I would go through, uh, next many years, actually, I would go through a lot of ups and downs in my faith. Um, I, I always envied people who, this is maybe going to sound bad, actually. Um, when I understand the very genuine cry of, I want to hear God's voice. Like, I don't hear God's voice. I want to hear it. And I get that. 
But I also was so jealous of you because I was like, I can't shut him up. Like, he would not stop talking to me. He would not stop bringing me into his presence. I would try and get away, and he would bring me back. I did not want to go into ministry. He would bring me back. Like, and I, I, I really mean that. I can't go into all of my story today because it's actually not even what matters. What matters is over all of those hills and valleys and the ones that I still experience today, the most constant thing in my life has been the church. And not, again, not this facade of a church or not the building of the church or not even a denomination or a certain pastor, but the Spirit of God whose plan all along was to use you and I in spite of you and I to spread his hope and his love to the world. And we have screwed this up a lot because we're imperfect But the second I started to realize that no matter who has hurt me from the church, and honestly, my dad, I had to recognize that he was really the first person, not intentionally, but to give me a a skewed version a little bit of God and his faithfulness because of my dad's faithfulness, right? Like he wasn't, to me, as an eight-year-old girl, I don't remember him coming to me, and probably appropriately that he didn't do this, but with his doubt or with his fear, right, or with his grief over the fact that this could end up in a way that none of us wanted it to. And as I've gotten older, obviously I've understood that, but it, it scarred me for a while. But I've been thinking really carefully over the past couple of months, especially, God has had me. I work for a church now full time, work with middle school and high school students and the lead youth pastor at National Community Church. And those students, I see some young people in the room today, middle school and high school, the next generation, I have so much hope for our future and the future of our church. But in order for them to be able to carry on this legacy that my dad has passed on, that people before him passed on to him, we have got to get real. We've got to get honest. And it's something that our, my students have taught me and challenged me with more than anything else, that if I'm just going to come to them and say, you should just come to church because it's what we do, and you should read the Bible because it's true, and, and not actually dive into the fact that, like, sometimes you're not going to like what you read. Sometimes you're not going to like what you hear. Sometimes life is going to turn out completely different than you ever expected it to, and you still can believe that God is good. If we don't get that real and that deep and open up our doors and open up our own lives and become vulnerable to other people around us to welcome them in with their doubt, with their pain, then people are just going to continue to walk away. And it's so important. And I've been thinking about this, like, and the question that has come to me over and over and over, just that I've been asking myself more than anything, is why have I stayed? Because it's not worth it for me to stay if this is just an attendance thing. It's not worth it for me to stay if this is just something that we do as good Christians. I didn't do that for a long time because I couldn't stomach it. Like There's something in that that felt wrong. I felt like I had been cheated by God. Like, why would I stay? Why would I keep going back? But it's caused me to review a lot of things in my life. And the only thing that has kept me on solid ground is knowing that there is something bigger going on something so untangible, something that we can't see, we can't feel, we can't fully understand, and yet, and yet, there is something so much larger going on at play, and we don't get to understand all of it all the time, but God is inviting us into it every step of the way. It's one of the most incredible things to me about God, and no matter how hard I've tried to just kind of use excuses or justify reasons why I have a right to be mad or I have a right to be sad and I have a right to just go on and live my life in another direction. It's, it's not been conviction necessarily that's brought me back. It's been God's compassion. It's been him saying, Brooke, I know that that wasn't fair, that we live in a broken world. It's knowing that his grief was larger than mine for my dad, for our church, for our family. And that compassion inviting me into not an excuse to just sit away and go hide in a corner and and be mad at the world, although he would still have compassion on me if that's what I went to do. But it was a compassion that compelled me to come out and just share that compassion with other people and help them see that that is the heart of God for his people, that there are always going to be things that grieve us, that there will always be unanswered questions, that that is the tension of life. That is the tension of faith. It's what actually keeps it so alive, right? 
If there wasn't that tension, if there weren't unanswered questions, would we even continue to seek God? I don't know. Like whenever I'm in a season of life where I feel like a lot of questions are being answered and life seems pretty good, I know it's actually harder for me to actively seek God in those seasons. And I'm not saying he, he creates these problems. I'm not saying he caused my dad to die, anything like that. But he is in the center of everything that's going on. And in a world that wants to polarize the church from the rest of the world, and in a world where the church polarizes itself sometimes by decisions that we make, it is actually the most equalizing thing that we could ever experience. It brings us all back on solid ground. It brings us all back into something that is some, well, the one thing that we can all unite on is that we are desperate to fill a void that is in us that is only, only able to be filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, um, like I said, I serve with students with middle school and high school in, in Washington, D.C., and I don't know if you guys have heard, but that's a fairly polarizing place, right? Like there are... Um, a lot of different viewpoints on things, a lot of people who are actively fighting against each other that live next door to each other also. Um, and so people have asked me, you know, how is it to minister in a place like that? And I've really tried to come up with a less kind of spiritual, kitschy type of answer because I, I, I feel like maybe it's lost its meaning, but I can't come up with any other way to say it other than the fact that we, ha we just focus on Jesus. Like there is, Jesus is so much bigger than any political party, than anyone who's in the White House. He's so much bigger. And when I, one of my, one of the most um, impactful moments for me after I moved to Washington, D.C. is I was trying to figure out culture there. It's, it's not only the political culture, it's actually not all political there. Like there's real families and, and real people. And, and um, whenever, when I try to figure out like the culture there, it changes also like every two to four years. So then you're like, oh, I've been there for four years now. I'm like, there's a lot of turnover. Our students, our families are always coming in, coming back out two years later, four years later. And it's really incredible because we get a chance to be the church to them and then send them out to the rest of the world. But one of the most impactful moments for me was a couple years ago or last winter, actually, we had some snow. And it's a very, we live in a swamp, really, like it's very, very flat and not like the Pacific Northwest, unfortunately, but uh, we do have one hill in the city and it's literally Capitol Hill. It's, it's, it's just a little hill, but it's right in, it's the yard, it's the lawn of the Capitol building. And I was on a walk, um, all, everything was shut down. Our offices were closed and I went on a walk and there was just all these kids and families sledding on the hill of the Capitol building. And it was such an impactful image for me because I was like, this is what I'm, this is what I think God's telling me. Like, Brooke, look bigger. Look at the, there's people. These are families. This is not just a city in, in 2019. This is last year. But like, this is not just, don't just focus in on what you can see and feel and experience here and now on earth. Like, these are souls with real hopes, with real dreams, with real vision, with real fears, with real jobs that they're afraid of losing for, you know, it's, it's so much more than what we make it. And it's when I started to really be able to minister in a way that I was like, okay, we're going to look at this as the equalizer, right? The church can be the equalizer. We do not need to polarize. And if we're polarizing and help making people feel like they're not welcome there because they don't share a certain view or because they don't believe a certain thing or they don't act a certain way, then what are we doing as the church? All we're doing is pushing people away. We cannot live in that way. And, and it was not until I started to understand that no matter what churches have done or what experiences I've had, that above all that, there is the God, right? It's not about the name above the church building. It's about the name above all names. There is a God that we can still serve no matter what our experience has been. And other people need to know this. We need to know this. And it's what's kept me in ministry. I was like, okay, this is saving my life. So who am I to hold back from that from other people? Who am I to hold that back from other people if I can be an example of how to have real questions, of how to have real struggle, real doubt, real anger, and still continue to seek God because his heart is so good. There's a, a scripture that um, just jumped out at me recently in Exodus 16. And we give the Israelites kind of a hard time, right? Like... 
wow, they, they still couldn't believe God. And, and they made all, like, God's shown them so many things and so many faithful miracles, these huge miracles, and they still doubt him. And yet, like, I look at them and I'm like, well, they were wandering for 40 years. I've got at least 20 years of wandering under my belt at this point. So, like, I can't really speak to that. But I, this verse here in particular is just on my heart. And I think it's what God just wants me to encourage all of us with this morning. And it, it's when the Israelites, they're, they're past the Red Sea, they're out of Egypt, but now they're hungry, right? And they're like, did you bring us out here to starve, right? Like, Moses, feed us, what's going on? And, and Moses goes to God, because he's like, I have all this stuff, all these people you told me to take care of, and like, there's no food. And this line, this half of a line in Exodus 16, verse 4, God says, I'm about to he says, I'm about to, he was saying, I'm about to feed you. I'm about to send you manna. I'm about to. He had already had a plan. There was something in motion. They just couldn't see it. There was something bigger happening than they could ever imagine. They, let alone the fact that they were going to be in scripture forever, that 2,000 years later, you and I get to continue to learn about the heart of God because of their lack of faithfulness or faithfulness, because of God's faithfulness, right? And he's saying, I am about Two, he already had a plan for how to provide, for how to guide, for how to strengthen their faith, for how to, to be dependable to them. He had a plan. He has a plan. And standing up here this morning, there's nothing in me that could ever deny again that God has a plan. When my dad died and our, our whole church family and my family were grieving and in this disillusionment and confusion, God was still saying, I'm about to. I'm about to do something more. I have a plan for you, Brooke. I have a plan for Chris. I have a plan for Terry. I have a plan for Cheney Faith Center. I have a plan for my kingdom. I have a plan for my people. I'm about to do something. And the key is for you and I to be honest about where we have these doubts. Bring them before the Lord and then say, okay, I trust you. I don't always like you but I trust you, right? Like, that's the honesty I'm talking about. We've got to get real. I held all of that in for so long, and I still struggle to not do that. But doubt is not toxic to our faith, right? Silence is. Doubt is not the thing that's going to threaten our relationship with God. It's us pretending to be perfect. It's us pretending that we actually don't have any doubts that's actually going to distance us so much from our God. I tell my students all the time to keep asking questions. We say four things all the time. We say that here you can ask anything but listen well, disagree freely, but love regardless. That if they are not going to a place where they feel safe to ask questions, they are not going to trust the church, and I wouldn't blame them, and they're not going to carry it forward. My dad modeled this for me probably without even knowing it, by including me in his life, by including me in his journey, by including me in tuning his guitar, right? He, he just walked alongside me. He cared about my life. And even though I only had eight years with him, that was a legacy that was planted in me so that I could continue to rely on that. I have to go back to that and say, my dad still believed, right? Like I know now as an adult, I'm like, there's no way he didn't have doubt. There's no way he didn't have fear. There's, he was human, right? But he still believed. And so that legacy now that lives in me, how am I passing that on to other people? How are you? Why do you stay? If you're coming here just to come because you have friends here and that's great, but there's something bigger at hand here. There's something bigger at stake here. We have a real God and we have a real enemy. And his only desire, his only means for existing is to destroy us. He, the John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take away our influence. He wants to take away our hope. He wants to take away our relationships. He wants to keep us so apathetic toward the church that maybe we're still coming every week, but we're not actually doing anything to pass that on, to really deepen our faith, to fight back against what the enemy is trying to do at every turn. Sometimes it's not healing from a situation that we need as much as it's healing from our doubts, healing from our questions, even in the midst of uncertainty that remains. But that's the great mystery of faith, right? 
that there are always going to be things that we don't understand, and yet there are always going to be reasons to trust God. So I just want to encourage you guys this morning. If I, I feel I, it's, I have a story, and that's the only thing that I can speak from, but God has given all of us a story. We need every single voice. We need every single person in this room is going to be able to influence somebody that I can't, that the person next to you can't. That's the beauty of the church. But first, we have to get real. So I just want to end with just posing the same questions to you guys. I feel God's asking me to answer honestly right now, and that is, what do we need him to be about to do? (laughs) That's horrible grammar, but where in your life are you like, God, what? Where are you? Maybe some of you guys are are really strong in your faith right now. Right now, then, is the season you need to pass that strength on to someone else. But some of us in the room are probably still struggling with doubt, or there are areas in your life where you're like, this makes no sense. I don't even know why I'm still coming. I don't even know why I still believe. I don't even know if, if I believe. Bring those to God and say, God, what are you about to do? Show me something. Show me what you want to do through me. Show me what you want to do in me. Where are you going through the motions? We are a part of something so much bigger than just motions and Sunday attendance at a church. We are part of a kingdom. We are part of a living, breathing creator who chose to crash down into his world through you and I. It's imperfect. That's one of my biggest unanswered questions. God, why would you use us if you knew we were going to screw it up so bad sometimes? But the church has remained despite it all, right? Cheney Faith Center is bigger than my dad. It's bigger than Pastor Mark and Kate. It's bigger than you guys. God willing, it's going to be here another 100 years from now. Two days ago, I spoke at my grandfather's memorial. My last grandparent that was living was very difficult, very close with him. But it was such an interesting, like, these are so weird. This weekend is so weird for me because it's like I'm, I'm, honoring somebody and talking about, yes, there's something so much more than this life here and now. And then I come here and see God's continual plan for this life here and now. This still matters. And there's something so much bigger of us than us that God is calling us. He's inviting us to step into it. So God, this morning, I am so grateful that you would even allow me to be here, allow any of my story to be redeemed. God, it's so humbling to remember that it is not about us, and yet you care deeply for us. So God, in that tension, in that confusion that even our daily walk with you brings, would you just bring some clarity? Would you show us what you're doing? Would you give us the courage to step into it in a deeper way than we ever have before? Would you give us the courage to be honest about the places of doubt that we have, but still go to you with it and not let it separate us from you? And as a church, as a body of believers, God, would you just motivate us? Would you stir us to step further into what you are doing in your kingdom? May your kingdom come. May your will be done. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Could we give Brooke a hand? Great job. Well, let's respond just for a minute because, Brooke, you said something super important. What a great verse. God's about to. And we know that God is faithful in every generation. Amen? Amen. So what is he about to do in you? I want to throw out a challenge to you this week. Would you intentionally... Take a half an hour this week and start to answer that question. God, what are you about to do in me? Is there something that I need in me that needs to get healed in me? Some big questions in me that needs to get figured out and that I need to ask you and get a couple answers for? Or is there something I need to be doing for your kingdom to use the influence that you've given me for the glory of your name and to see people come to know you and believe in you and serve you all the days of their life. So would you take a half an hour this week? I'm just going to throw it out there as a challenge to you and start to answer this question. God, what are you about to do in me?
And what do you want to do in our city? Amen? I think it's really cool that Steve started something in 1981, and it's continuing. It's, it was interesting. We, we got to spend time with, with Brooke last night, and to hear her talk about her dad, and the Martins were at the table, and the Schroeders were at the table, and we're like, that's just like Mark. That's exactly who you are. You yell at referees just like Steve did. <laughs> when we go to a basketball game, it's intense. You know, so, next to Pastor Mark, he's crazy out there, right? These things were true about Steve, and they're true about who we are. And I think that there's a reason that Genie Face Center is the way, the way it is, is because the DNA of what the Holy Spirit wanted to do in this city is back. And that's what God is doing. And so we can say, praise God that your church, that what you're doing, your plan is happening here. But guess what? You're part of that plan. It's not just my plan. It's not just Kate's plan. It's not just Brooks or Steve's. It's God's plan. So how are you coming into God's plan? I want to throw that out to you. All right? Last thing I want us to do, I want us to pray for Brooke because anyone that would live in Washington, D.C. and serve there needs some prayer. Amen? <laughs> so would you extend your hand towards her? Let's just pray for Brooke. Lord, we thank you so much for Brooke. Thank you for this legacy that we got to see this morning of our plant pastor, of our plant family, of faithfulness to Jesus years ago that allows us to sit here today and be faithful to you in our generation. Thank you, Jesus, that you are so faithful to us. We pray that you would be faithful to Brooke, that you would use her in a powerful and a mighty way in a place that is very challenging to minister to in a place where sometimes she doesn't have very much time with a family or some youth? Would you give her unbelievable influence and power through the Holy Spirit to touch kids' lives in, in a short amount of time so that they will get saved, filled with your Spirit, discipled and set free and, and ready to go and serve you wherever their next spot is? Lord, would you just do an awesome work in her and would you keep us connected as a church so that we can see your plan at work in all of us? In the name of Jesus, we pray. We all said, amen. amen. All right.